Well, hi, everybody. I'm Rick Edelman. Thanks for joining us for this webinar. I'm really glad that you're here. This is extraordinarily topical, and that's why we have such a large crowd registered for this event. I'm not at all surprised. Uh, what is going to happen next to bond portfolios now that rates are widely expected to drop? And nobody better to help us figure all this out than Jerome Schneider, who is the portfolio manager uh, at PIMCO. Jerome, it's great to have you with us here on the uh, webinar today. Hey, thank you, Rick. We appreciate uh, the, you know the the focus on the bond market, and specifically, as you mentioned, it's very timely right now. Not just given the recent economic data, but really thinking about where the Fed is going, not just in a week or so, but really over the longer term, and that has greater implications for portfolios than most people would suspect. And we're going to discuss that over the next hour or so. For sure. Uh, and and PIMCO doesn't need any introduction, but let's do it anyway as a formality. The world's leading bond fund manager. Tell us about PIMCO. Yeah, PIMCO has been in existence for more than 50 years. We manage a, a little over $2 trillion at this point in time. Uh, we've grown to about 3,800 people since that point in time, of which about 270, 280 people are dedicated to the portfolio management roles like myself and managing risk and finding solutions on behalf of our clients. And the way we think about PIMCO is it's a global business. It's a global fixed income business where we have some traditional aspects of mutual funds and ETFs, but also we have uh, more recently over the past few decades and, and look to find solutions in the alternative spaces, whether it's private credit, real estate, et cetera. So the way we think about the opportunity set is how do you balance active management within the world of income producing assets? And then at the same time, taking uh, taking the work out of an inve individual investors' hands and really finding opportunities that balance credit work, liquidity, and then market analysts from a global and a economic point of view. It's really a complex world and you need a lot of resources to encounter it at this point in time. And we're going to dive into all of this. Uh, a lot of you have sent in questions uh, in advance uh, when you signed up for the webinar. We're going to tackle your questions uh, for Jerome as well. Uh, and if you have any questions uh, as a result of what you hear today, you can go to the Q&A box uh, and enter your question there. I'll curate all that and uh, look for the questions that are uh, on point to what we're talking about here. Uh, let, let's start with uh, what happened, Jerome, uh, over the past couple of weeks. Uh, what do you make of what's going on right now? Uh, undoubtedly, what we've seen is a shift in focus by the Federal Reserve and, and frankly, by the markets itself. Uh, more broadly, you know, we've obviously come out uh, pretty decisively uh, from the pandemic era uh, stimulus that's been on the fiscal side and the accommodation from the monetary policy side. And that has lent itself to a variety of, of outcomes. Um, number one, the Federal Reserve specifically is going to be focused, instead of fighting inflation, really focusing on growth and supporting growth and employment. And there's a profound effect, which we're going to begin to see next week, where the Federal Reserve is going to begin to ease, cut interest rates to varying degrees, and to be focused on that growth element, wages, and specifically employment, is something that's going to be really shifting the spotlight out of simply fighting inflation that we've encountered and have seen come back down to more normalized ranges, maybe not as comfortable as they would like, but more normalized ranges compared to where we were 18 to 24 months ago, and now really focus on how do they manage a soft landing in the economy. And not well, we may necessarily argue amongst ourselves what a soft landing means, and there's clearly a very bifurcated, undulating you know, view of where the economy is and how people are going to be affected with the economy. Where we find ourselves today is that the data from an inflation point of view is more muted, from a growth point of view is beginning to soften a little bit as we see in indicators like the unemployment rate ticking above 4% at this point in time. And from a big picture perspective, from an investor point of view, it's, well, it might be hard to sort of manage the day-to-day -day of the data that you hear. The reality is, is that a more accommodative Fed is going to likely reduce interest rates beginning next week and then do so over the course of the next year to varying degrees. Again, focusing on the data, but the trajectory is clear that the need for higher interest rates, which are putting brakes on the economy, and more importantly, brakes on inflation, is beginning to shift in that paradigm. And that's really where we're focused on right now about how to have the outlook for the economy calibrate to how your outlook for investments should be recalibrated over the near term. So you mentioned next week at the ne next Fed meeting, uh, most are saying it's going to be a half a point and that the market has already priced that in. Do you share that point of view? 
Well, it's a, it's a great point. And, you know, to be honest with you, it's a minute by minute calculation. So one of the beautiful things about where I sit when I get into work here at 3.30 in the morning on the West Coast is seeing where the market reactions are. And this morning when we had uh, the CPI data, uh, the Consumer Price Index data for inflation, the market sort of recalibrated the other way. What was a reasonable probability of a 50 basis point cut next week is now more muted to about a 20% probability of a 50 basis point cut. Now, let's not really delve into are they going to cut and by how much they're definitely going to cut by 25 basis points they've communicated that very effectively and punctuated it with by a litany of speakers the flip side is from an individual investor from an advisor point of view don't necessarily get caught up in the day-to-day -day interactions and flummoxes of the probabilities is the fed going to cut 50 75 25 or nothing the trajectory of the federal reserve in the near term is to ease is to maintain easy financial conditions, meaning they're not trying to tighten them. They're not trying to slow down the economy purposely like they were 12 months ago, but instead be more accommodative. And that means generally less rate increases. So to answer the question, we think that there's a higher probability that you only get 25 basis points in September and for the rest of the year, which is slightly under expectations for the market, but the trajectory is clear. And that's really what shifts the paradigm for investing over the medium term here. And obviously, the motivation of the Fed is to alter interest rates in an effort to avoid uh, a recession and broader economic slowdown, hurting jobs and all that other uh, good stuff. So how low do you think or how big a series of cuts do you see the Fed making over time? Yeah, this is a great question. And you can look throughout history of the theories of monetary policy, not just in the United States, but globally, and, and see examples of uh, the central bankers being the problem, so to speak, and sort of breaking the economy. Um, and, and, you know, I, you know, to be, they don't really hand out many accolades to central bankers. And, you know, I, I'm sure there's a, uh, if you took a poll of, of the people watching today, there'd be pros and cons of central banking policy for Jerome Powell. But the reality is, is that it was a pretty tough situation, a unique situation that we've come through. It required a little bit more flexibility in monetary policy, a little bit less orientation to the model driven economics output that central bankers like to have and, and a more functional output. And we've seen that and it's actually been somewhat somewhat supportive to the economy uh, over the over the course of the of this, uh, secular horizon over the past five years. Going forward, you know, what we're going to find is that that's going to be a little bit more deliberative in terms of how this policy evolves. From our perspective, you know, the, the monetary policy, the Federal Reserve is going to take this in stride. They're going to see if the economy needs more support in the unemployment rate, they're going to cut rates further quicker. We don't see that weakness in the near term here. You know, we think that the economy and specifically growth in the U.S. economy and North America in general is still growing somewhere between 2.7 and 2.8 percent for the remainder of 2024. That's above target. And then as we get into 2025, sure, it slows down, but it's not a recession. It's about a 1.5 to 2% growth, real growth outlook. That means after inflation is accounted for. That's not terrible. It's not great, but it's not terrible. And so there's going to be a balanced approach to that accommodation probably over the intermediate term here in terms of how we're thinking about it. So the Fed should, it does come into play in terms of this calculus, but not necessarily as meaningfully as some of market pr practitioners might suggest. So we, we we can't ignore the elephant in the room, and that, of course, is the election coming up. Sure. Uh, and we know that uh, according to all the polling data, and this election cycle is no different from every other presidential election cycle, all the polls are telling us, once again, this four-year cycle, that the number one issue on the uh, electorate's mind is the economy. Um, way back from when James Cargill said, it's the economy, stupid. Uh, yeah. And so with everybody focusing on the economy, we know that there are basically two groups of Americans, if we want to split them this way broadly, those that are doing fine in the economy who are affluent uh, and wealthy individuals, and those who aren't, those who are living paycheck to paycheck, worrying about whether they're going to have a job next month, et cetera. So given those two camps, is a Fed rate cut going to make any difference in the economy in the short term in uh, enough so that it would alter the way anybody might vote? Undoubtedly. And I don't want to suggest that the minutia or the undulations or the granularity of the economy is not substantive. The, the, the economy is made up of real lives with real people and does real things. And cutting rates and monetary policy takes time. It has a lagged effect. But 
it does have effect on the real world. So yes, it affects bond prices, but it does affect everything else along the way as well as we're seeing in the mortgage market, as well as wage, uh, real wages, take home wages for people. Um, but the answer is, is if, if you know the Fed cuts 25 basis points or 50 basis points, it, it doesn't rally one candidate versus another. Instead, you know, really what people should be focused on is is not necessarily an elephant in the room, but a focal point that we like to think about here at PIMCO is really focusing on the fiscal elements of fiscal spending, fiscal responsibility. It's something that weighs on both sides of the aisle, quite honestly, and just you know, despite one candidate or the other, it's something that's going to have to be wrangled with in 2025 in a variety of ways. The most focal point really for investors to think about is tax implications. We had the tax cuts expiring, the Trump tax cuts expiring in 2025, and that's going to be a formidable task to rationalize for Congress itself. And so while we don't think there's going to be draconian measures and don't, I mean, we would suggest that clients and investors don't necessarily get wrapped up in some of the extreme output of rhetoric that comes from the fiscal policy or even the tax cuts or tax increases that might say the the stalemate in congress that's likely the likely outcome or a, a split congress if you will is going to be uh, likely a more balanced approach and you know in 2025 uh, Congress is going to be focused on that fiscal element, maybe not the long-term element that they should in terms of how much debt is outstanding in the United States, but more in the myopic sense of where those tax cuts sunset or not sunset. And there will be some implications for investors along the way that, again, will not be uniform, but that's something that individuals are going to have to take into account. So in terms of the reality of the election, it is important, but it's less important in the near-term sense in terms of markets and output as opposed to the long-term sense of where is the debt sustainability for the United States over the next 5, 10, 15, 25 years. That's a real question that we deal with and grapple with at PEMCO as we think about long-term investment implications. So I want to ask you the, the number one question that is on everybody's minds, the reason I think the vast majority of folks are attending this webinar. Before I get to that question, though, which I think everybody knows what it's going to be, uh, I, I want to make one comment, uh, because while most of the folks watching this are financial advisors, there are a large number of individual investors. Uh, and individual investors often don't realize the impact uh, or the relationship between interest rates and bond prices. Uh, we know, uh, and this is a factual statement, I'm sure you'll agree with me, Jerome, this is fact, not opinion, that as interest rates go down, the value of bonds goes up and vice versa. Um, you agree with that? Yeah, it, for, for U.S. Treasuries, for non-credit sensitive instruments, and I'll just qualify it not to complicate the issue, but that's the relationship. You know, bond prices go down, yields go higher and vice versa. And what we're experiencing is a great point to highlight here, Rick, which is typically what we've witnessed more recently in people's mind in 2022 was the opposite. Yields went higher, bond prices went lower. We're now seeing that paradigm shift. And this is exactly why we need to be thinking about a more balanced approach to portfolios, because as yields go down because of the Fed rate cuts and things like that, they may not necessarily get to zero. In fact, and that's not in the PIMCO forecast at all. But as the rates move lower, closer to a 3.5%, maybe a 3%, what we call neutral rate, that means bond prices appreciate. And that's how bond portfolios produce positive returns, positive total returns over the and, near term. And there, and that leads to the question that I I know you're, you're, you know what I'm about to ask you. Everybody knows what I'm about to ask you. As a result of all of this, with interest rates coming down, therefore bond prices rising, what should we be doing with our fixed income allocation? Most investors have 40 to 60% of their money in bonds, some even more. So this is a big deal. So what should we do with the bonds in our portfolio? So there's two things that really focus, and I'll just spend a moment talking about where we've come from and where we are today, because that's an important starting point to the psychology of investments and the bias that we've had. Number one, we've clearly seen a, over the past, let's call it 20 years, a generational shift in, in terms of how people think about investment allocations. And while your our idealized portfolio might be a 60-40 portfolio, it, it may not necessarily be. And our, our studies would actually suggest that people are under-allocated true fixed income allocations. They might be over-allocated to cash as part of that, cash-like strategies, but in terms of active fixed income or active or uh, interest rate exposed fixed income strategies, they're probably under-allocated at this point in time. Why is that? Because the past 20 years, 
investors have been focused on capital appreciation. And the way they've gotten capital appreciation is typically the equity markets and equity like returns. Bond, you know, stock prices moved from 100 and went to 120. They were looking for that type of return. Bond prices didn't necessarily weren't that attractive. And, and bond yields definitely weren't as they were at zero. So from that perspective, that paradigm has shifted. It shifted in 2022 and 23 when we saw risk-free rates go from zero to 5%. The natural reaction function over the past year and a half was to play it safe, be in cash, be in money market funds, be in treasury bills. Mm -hmm. I can't really argue with that. We run a pretty large business here at PIMCO focusing on the front end of the yield curve, $300 billion in fact. But the reality is when we now are finding ourselves in the world of potential for rate cuts from the Federal Reserve, the attraction for cash those, those yields at 5% plus by keeping it very traditionally safe in money market funds are going to be fleeting. And this is where the compliment comes, is that when you think of fixed income returns, it's not just about the yield, Rick. It's about yield plus return, what we call capital appreciation, that produces a total return. And so the emphasis on just simply your coupon or your yield and your income, it is important. But when accompanied with opportunities to have some price appreciation along the way, makes it makes bonds and fixed income portfolios have more equity-like returns than we've seen in almost 20 years at this point in time. So you're actually suggesting that, that the bond market will challenge the stock market in its uh, investment uh, outlook? Maybe, maybe not necessarily on a literal sense. There might be years where it does outperform or not. But when you think about it, and not to get too wonkish here as, as a bond portfolio manager, <laughs> I don't want to make, turn people off here, but people have this guttural instinct about when equities or when risk assets reprice lower. It, we call that volatility. And without getting into the semantics of what volatility means to bond portfolios, when you have price adjustments, people don't necessarily like that. And that is what we sort of lean into here in the fixed income universe, suggesting that you might have returns that have a lower volatility profile that are in the neighborhood of equity-like returns. And what we think we are is a better chance as the Fed moves into action eases rates and moves to that lower rate cycle, that you can have equity-like returns with a lower volatility profile. So that's where we are sort of saying for investors, take a moment, evaluate your overall position in fixed income, rationalize how much you have in cash, which means it likely is going to be need to be reduced because those returns are moving down as the Fed cuts rates, and then find ways to balance it with some price appreciation in bonds. And that's really where we are. We're at that pivot point right now uh, Rick, as we sort of begin to embark upon these easing cycles. So I, I want to make sure I heard you right, Jerome. Uh, did, did I hear you say that on a risk-adjusted basis, bonds represent as good an investment opportunity as stocks? They, they might not have the same gain, but on a risk-adjusted basis, they're going to hold their own. Yeah. And, and this is really where we think about it. And, and you have to sort of delve into what fixed income means, and we're going to get, we'll probably get to that in, in a few minutes, but fixed income in and of itself is, is a pretty specific universe of opportunities. Running a diversified portfolio in fixed income allows you to mitigate a lot of the risks in, in terms of credit risk, liquidity risks, et cetera. But at the same time, it has a lower volatility traditionally than equity-like returns. And when you have a tailwind with the Federal Reserve, and a growth outlook, which is relatively stable, although slightly under benchmark, meaning one and a half to 2%, not 2% to 3%, that's still actually a pretty good environment to have equity-like returns. In fact, if you have a lower expectation of growth, you should then begin to question how your risk appetite really has for those returns, which are more, more, more economically outlook sensitive, if you will. You mentioned a moment ago, uh, the notion of cash that a lot of folks have as part of their, uh, allocation to fixed income, a disproportionate, too much of it in cash, which is earning, or at least over the last several years, earning, you know, zero point nothing, uh, a little bit better recently, but still very low, uh, not as high as the rate of inflation. Talk about cash positions, given all of this going on, how much should we hold in cash these days? There's a litany of surveys that suggest cash positions in, in investors' portfolio are anywhere from 5 to 25%. And, and that's an astounding number, quite honestly. And when you look at the aggregated number of mon, uh, assets in money market funds and government money market funds, it's all at record highs, a $6.6 .6 trillion. That's a huge number. Um, and the reason is, is that you can earn you know, north of 5% by doing basically nothing and having no credit risk. And that's, that's warm and an attractive blanket for people to be in. 
But here's the thing to think about. And I think this is why we're sort of having this call. It's timely right now. But when we think about it and look at the historical data, what we typically find is investors focusing on those cash allocations are euphoric for those yields for that income until they don't realize that there's that income anymore. And what we find is that investors tend to hang on to their overweight and cash allocations anywhere from 18 to 24 months, well after the Federal Reserve begins to cut. Mm -hmm. And so from that perspective, if you're sitting in a world of cash, you know, two years from now, if you look at sort of the market orientation of where they think that Fed funds at market's gonna go, you go from a 525 Fed funds market to a 275 Fed funds market, what the market is telling you right now. And that cash orientation just means you're gonna be earning, you know, the 250 plus basis points of less income along the way. More importantly though, you miss out on the opportunity for that price appreciation in bonds that's going to be forthcoming likely because of that tailwind scenario. So it's not just about the lost income opportunity, it's about also the opportunity that a balanced portfolio that has a more diversification offers you given the tailwind of Fed rate cuts over that medium term. So so the two messages here uh, I'm hearing. First, you're, most folks are holding on to too much in cash for too long a period. It's fine to do it at 5%, but when those money markets go down to two and a half, if you're not paying attention, you don't even realize that your yield has dropped dramatically. That's the first message that I'm hearing. The second message I'm hearing is that you need to solve that problem by shifting out of the money market funds and into actual bond positions. Uh, that raises a new question because in the world of bonds, we have very short term to very long term, you know, 30 days to 30 years. So what kind of bonds and in terms of the d duration and maturity, forget about credit quality for the moment and issuers, just focusing on time, what kind of bonds are you suggesting people be moving toward? So this is really where we will we'll, we'll create a baseline of the discussion. And, and if we were talking to clients, advisors are speaking to their clients, the first thing they're going to do is rationalize their liquidity profile of the client. So maybe they don't need 20% in cash. Maybe it's only 5%. We're not suggesting get rid of cash entirely, but it's a more minimalistic approach than, than usual. And more importantly, the residual amount that you don't need, you need to think about how to actively manage it. And what we mean by that at PIMCO is think about ways that take advantage of diversified portfolios across different asset classes, and then more importantly, takes advantage of what you find or what you may find is the most attractive part of the bond market. And that means what kind of quality, where on the interest rate curve you want to invest. And in this case, today, we would still encourage investors to be within 10 years of investing in, the, in those portfolios, remain high in quality, generally just get sort of given the more timid outlook of the economy, given, given where we're headed, not necessarily a recession, but not necessarily a super growth outlook, and then await for opportunities. And that's where our active management approach lends itself to be able to pivot within the portfolio as opportunities present themselves, whether that's new issuers coming to market, different rotations, and you also want to adapt to the changing outlook of the economy. And so what might be an interesting sector to invest in today may not be in six months or 12 months or 24 months. And so uh, evaluating those from a more active approach allows you to be offensive when there's good opportunities, but defensive when you need to, you know, you know, tighten the belt a little bit and focus on, you know, making sure that capital preservation approach it remains intact at that point in time. So that in and of itself is simply moving out of that world of day-to-day -day cash management and then having a healthy balance across the across the opportunity sets within the front end of the yield curve. And that could entail owning things from like US treasuries, municipal bonds, but also corporate bonds, some as high quality asset backed securities, even agency mortgages, which all produce high quality cash flows. Those are instruments that we at PIMCO have a great deal of resources and team to underwrite that we would utilize in creating these diversified portfolios along the way for investors. And let's talk about those portfolios. There, there are two basic ways, two, two basic choices that, that investors and their advisors have. You either buy the individual bonds uh, for the portfolio or you buy an, an ETF, uh, you buy a fund uh, of those bonds. Uh, which is it that you suggest advisors should choose and, and investors themselves and, and why is one superior to the other? Yeah, you know, undoubtedly, there's different approaches for different clients and, and advisors, you know, still like to think and select different uh, individual bonds along the way for specific purposes. 
but I think the the one two things that really come up as as the three things that really come up in terms of thinking about it are number one operationally what kind of execution are you getting on buying an individual bond? Is it institutional execution that PIMCO gets? Meaning how cheaply can you buy the bond? Or more importantly, what is your, how effectively can you sell the bond within the market? That's number one. Number two, when you think about the risk in the bond, and again, no risk in US treasuries with, with that per se, but when you have more credit sensitive bonds, even high quality corporate bonds, that's something where you want to have more diversified approach and diversify your risks, your credit risks, your structural risks. And having a portfolio of bonds helps to diversify that along the way. And then the third element is not just simply when you own a bond that has a maturity to it, the best you'll ever have is, uh, the best you'll ever earn on that is the yield on the bond. So if it's a 5% coupon bond for five years, you're going to earn 5% per year. That might seem attractive to people. And there's a certain romance of having that security in along the way. But the other side of it is, is that you're also giving up the opportunity to have price appreciation in the in that and you're also giving up the opportunity per se of actively managing should the macro environment should the macro economic environment change meaning you need to become more defensive or there's a better relative value of bonds and that's really where taking an approach to employing a, an advisor or more importantly an etf manager or a mutual fund manager that really focuses on that portfolio effect that portfolio construction and daily comes in and finds those opportunities and then recalibrates to be more defensive as needed. And that's really the balance as the market evolves over time, you wanna be very cognizant of, of those risks and how they change. And that's where accessing the expertise, if you will, through an actively managed ETF really, you know, really has you know, been a great advantage, a distinct advantage to the individual investors and advisors over the past decade as these active ETFs have really come into the fixed income nomenclature and utilization. You had mentioned uh, the number one point that, that you said was most important was, can you sell the bond in the future? Talk about how PIMCO manages liquidity um, in your ETFs, because that, that is indeed a huge issue. Absolutely. And, and the way we think about it is, you know, across our set, across our, our complex, again, globally for PIMCO, we have portfolio managers who are really focused on different avenues of risk and understanding that. And then more broadly speaking, thinking about opportunity sets for specific clients. My specialty is in the front end of the yield curve and focusing on capital preservation, liquidity management, and then focusing on the ETF landscape. And what we find ourselves in is taking an active approach to liquidity, specifically in terms of how portfolios are constructed, not having overly large concentrations in bonds. Number two, focusing on how much cash is actually within a portfolio to meet redemptions, but also to be opportunistic if we wanted to buy bonds. These are functions of not only just my opinion and our team's opinion at PIMCO within the portfolio management space, but our risk, our risk team, which is going to have a view in terms of overall global liquidity, which one aspect of that is how the Federal Reserve manage is it manages its liquidity programs and tightens it, but also then focusing on the analytical approach, thinking at different relationships of where bond price premiums play out and, and thinking about the portfolio. And from that point of view, every day we come in and think about how much cash is appropriate to have in individual strategies to make sure those opportunities, but yet to be balanced should our clients need money. And that's something that we've been very, very proactive about managing resources in, over the past 50 years. And so we've been, you know, a much, a, quite honestly, a liquidity provider during times of stress to money of our clients because their primary liquidity providers couldn't do that. And we've seen that historically in the global financial crisis, obviously during the COVID crisis, variety of points. That's one element of liquidity, portfolio level of liquidity. The second one, which is very interesting, is looking at the market makers specifically for ETFs and how they are thinking about it. And one way simply to look at is how much volume is transacted in a specific ETF. But more importantly, what is the bid offer? What is the bid offer spread? Where can you buy the bond? Where can you sell the bond? And what is that price differential? And for advisors, they should really do two things. Number one, evaluate that. And why is the bid offer of this type of ETF, you know, X? and yet it's two times X for a very similar ETF otherwise. There's a variety of reasons. Number one, the sponsorship, the sponsor of the manager, how involved the manager is. So for us at PEMCO, we're dealing with those market makers daily, having discussions in terms of our liquidity management. And more importantly, they know that our ETF complex, which is 30 billion in size, is part of a larger $300 billion 
short-term and low-duration complex, which is part of a $2 trillion fixed income complex. So they have a lot of security. It's very different than a small manager who simply just might have sponsorship for that. So knowing how those market makers react is very important and having that relationship. And the final thing is a simple suggestion to advisors and individual investors is when you go into this world of active ETFs and in general, make sure you put a limit order in and make sure you know that price because you want to make sure you get executed at what you think the right value is and maintain that because we often see in some of the competitor spaces, people put in market orders that get very much drifted one way or the other based upon flows or things like that. So there's a variety of liquidity conditions that we try to you know, mitigate effectively within the portfolio construction, but also as an investor, recognize the fact that it, it is a bit of, re, it's a lot of resources that PIMCO puts behind those multi, those different levels of liquidity management along the way. You know, it, it is interesting that you cite all that because I have found in my experience that a lot of investors assume that the complexity the biggest area of complexity in the financial markets is in the stock market, trying to choose a stock and look at all the data that you get on stock analysis and that they figure bonds, you know, what's the big deal? A bond is a bond is a bond. All you got to do is look at the interest rate and, it, and it's not a, not complicated at all. In fact, it's really the, just the exact opposite. The bond market is so much more complicated than the stock market. And one of the big issues is the fact that in the stock market, I mean, look at look at the S&P 500. 500 stocks represent the biggest companies in America. There are, what, over 10,000 individual bonds that are available in the country from an incredible array of issuers. And each individual issuer might be releasing hundreds of bonds over time. I mean, how many different bonds has IBM issued uh, that yeah. are available it, in the market? You know, it, 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 you know, it dazzles us that, that that's the case. And I think this is one of the interesting facets of well, when people think about the, you know, the bond aggregate, and, and they think that, that that is the proxy for the bond universe. It, it's actually an interesting discussion because if you look historically at the world of active management. And, and that's where a portfolio manager, an advisor has discretion to deviate from a set benchmark to produce returns, excess returns, hopefully for clients. There's not necessarily a great track record for that in the equity side. And I know that's not the purpose of this call, but in the fixed income side, it's actually pretty interesting. And there's a, a formidable and longstanding uh, history that suggests on average, active managers can produce returns 60 to 70% of the time because of the composition of the indexes themselves. So as you highlight, IBM, Apple Computer, General Motors, Ford, all these companies come and there's not necessarily one bond that's out there, but there's probably one bond in the index. And so there's differentiation in returns and profiles of every one of these bonds that is up to our analyst and our portfolio management team and our traders to make those discernible relative value opportunities and that's how you produce excess returns along the way. So undoubtedly, the allocation, the big picture allocation, what we will call beta is important, but how you employ those allocations is decisively different and specifically different in fixed income that allows PIMCO to, out, to outperform in the active space almost more than 80% of the time. And that's really the value proposition at this point in time is utilizing those resources to underweight certain credits or sectors that you think are more economically sensitive as the economy softens perhaps, and find more things that are more insular, that are cheap or relative value that also produce income that people might be overlooking. And that creates a different opportunity set for folks. That's what our job is at PIMCO across those diversified portfolios. I, I want to let everybody know that, that PIMCO offers a really cool two-page doc called bonds are different. Um, and we are going to push that out to you here on the webinar so that you can uh, click the link and get this document uh, yourself. It's it's a quick, easy read, but it's pretty profound in the argument as to why you need to treat the bond portfolio different from the stock portfolio, that passive management in stocks is a routine approach and makes sense, but an active approach in bonds is really worth consideration, as Jerome just highlighted, and this two-page uh, doc really um, is very insightful and really eye-opening. So you've got the link uh, right there um, uh, here on Zoom. Click that link and you'll be able to get a hold of that uh, document. There's also an ETF quick sheet, because we mentioned that uh, PIMCO, of course, one of the largest bond fund managers and a lot of ETFs, uh, an ETF quick sheet, which shows you all the different offerings that PIMCO has, uh, that'll give you a lot of um, 
uh, a lot of understanding of the, of the variety. And, and to that point, Jerome, you know, Pimco has been doing this for decades, I, mean, I, think, I think half a century. 50 years uh, now, yeah. Uh, what's differentiated the firm? I mean, there's a lot of competition in the bond market and bond fund managers. What's differentiated Pimco? There, there is there is some competition, and 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 I think that's part of it. I think what Pimco's really done well uh, over the past few, past you know fifty years, but more more recently, um, has been being decisive about having a discussion about where global economics create opportunity in the investment cycle and opportunity for investors. And, and that's you know from our views dating back to two thousand five of of the housing bubble to thinking about coming out of the European banking crisis in 2012. And even as we exited COVID in terms of thinking about how the economy is going to be rationalized over those points in time, those views, while you can't necessarily bet on things like GDP per se, or things like that, that are wonky ec economist type of jargon and discussions, what it does allow you to do is create an investment profile, an investment protocol, and a thesis which allows you to look at the bond market, look at the fixed income market, look at the investment market in general, and balance between where you think interest rates are headed, where you think there's opportunities to earn additional income, which we would call spread, where globally there's opportunities. So not just in the United States, but is there opportunities around the world that interest rates might be higher or more, more have more uh, absolute return possibility or price appreciation. You, some of those places today are example in Australia, or maybe even Canada. Those are global opportunities, but it comes into understanding where those opportunities are. And so we've for established our strategy sessions, our investment committees to really be focused on understanding the global economics, understanding how monetary policy, how Jerome Powell, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Canada, the Royal Bank of uh, RBA in Australia, uh, Bank of England, et cetera, how that all comes together to make it an investable paradigm, an investable asset class, and then put it into your ETFs and our and, and our mutual funds. And it's not just as simple as simply saying, I think rates are going down, so here's, here's the way to go. There's opportunities, relative opportunities and absolute opportunities, which you need to be aware of. And most importantly, you know, have your eyes peeled for not just good things that can happen, but obviously the negative. And some people might say bond investors are pessimistic by nature, <laughs> but really what we are thinking about is what is the best way to deploy capital? With your, if you're thinking about over the next year or two, utilize a strategy that has a shorter term horizon. But we're still thinking about those risks over the shorter term horizon. If you're looking out further, maybe you're a, in a high tax state and you need municipal opportunities to sort of bear, bear with that. Look at what those opportunities are, but don't necessarily think about you know how you can how you can find those opportunities. Is looking at diversified portfolios that maybe takes a little bit of credit risk and do so that has the resources to underwrite that credit risk. And municipals are, is one example where you might actually want to be a little bit further out the curve because there's those opportunities given the way municipalities behave in a lower growth environment. It's actually pretty insular at this point in time. We've got a, a bunch of questions that, that folks have asked. Uh, Glenn uh, asked this one, just because short-term rates are going to come down by the Fed, does that mean that long-term rates are going to come down very much? Yeah, that's a great question. And 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 not to answer a question with a question, but you almost have to ask yourself, what is your view on the fiscal outlook for the United States and the supply outlook of how many treasuries are going to actually be issued across the yield curve? And so our deficit here in the United States is probably forecast to be growing by about 6% or so over the next few years. And, and that's, again, regardless of whatever the administration happens in the near term. And, and that has implications of where do you think what we would call the term premium for owning longer duration, longer maturity bonds are. So yes, bonds at the front of the yield curve 10 years in will probably be more influenced by the near term interest rate cuts and the behavior of the Federal Reserve. But longer term implications are really focused on what is the premium that investors want to earn for having the potential for returns and specifically inflation adjusted returns based upon a view of inflation. So you have to basically have an assumption of inflation over the next 10 years plus. And then what is the outlook for fiscal stability? Like if, if you're buying a 30 year bond and you have 10 years from now in that 30 year bond, the United States continues spending at a higher, uh, a higher trajectory than is assumed, undoubtedly those bond prices are going to be affected. So we want to be focusing on that. So the shape of the yield curve, from our, our opinion, Glenn, is that it will steepen over the medium term here, really propelled by the cut in the front end yields, uh, the decrease in front end yields, price appreciation in that front end yield curve. 
So Lawrence is asking a question here, and I just find it so funny. Um, and not because it's a, a silly question, it's not, but it's I'm, I'm laughing because I'm, this has never occurred to me, uh, and it's a brilliant question. Uh, why does the Fed stick when it lowers or raises interest rates? Why does it do it in increments of 25 bips? That's this a real, is, <laughs> why isn't this it is, 35 or 45 or 17? <laughs> yeah, this is this is a great question. And back in the day, um, it, it's been about you know 25 plus years that they have, have actually not increased rates by that quarter point increment. And the part of the reason is, is that they adopted a, you know, a range value of, of, of Fed funds, not a precise, precise value. And if you actually look at fund funds now, it's a range of 525 to 550, not a, a specific number. So they're adjusting a bandwidth, not a specific target like they had in the past. And it used to be functional on a day-to-day -day basis that you know, we didn't actually know what the target was uh, back in the day when I was first starting my career 30 years ago plus. You know, what they would do is simply, you know, drain or, or add reserves to, to the market to get the Fed funds rate to an, an approximate level of where it was. And since then, they become more prescriptive and they actually pr produce a target range and before that, a specific target. And so we have seen them operate in, 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 in smaller increments, but it seems unlikely at this point in time, unless actually the, when they get around the table of the Eccles building next week, they actually get exactly a split vote and they are you know decide that the best thing to do is go by that eighth of a point <laughs> increment, which is not unheard of. But even on our own desk, we were laughing about it last week. Uh, it seems an unlikely outcome at this point in time. So there are a few ETFs that I think we really need to talk about. Uh, one of them is Mint. You know, this this is uh, one of the one of the first, one of the most widely used active bond ETFs. It's 15 years old now. Uh, who uses it? Why do they use it? And how are they using it? Yeah, so Mint was created back in 2009 by our team, uh, and 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 it has been managed by myself and our team since inception. But it really had d wanted to do two things. Number one, prove that we had the ability in the ETF landscape to produce an actively managed ETF, meaning go through the world and find actively managed bonds to buy and sell through through the life cycle of a strategy. The second one was provide a solution for investors looking to move out of cash, looking to move out of treasury bills, money market funds, and things like that. And what we found is that there's a great deal of investors, advisors, institutional investors, individuals who want to earn an additional return because their horizon for liquidity may not necessarily be today versus tomorrow, but might be over the next six months or 12 months. And the difference is, is that in a Mint-like product, in Mint ETF, you are actually looking to earn liquidity premiums earn additional returns because of that longer term horizon, as opposed to having below market benchmark real returns and yields in a money market fund. And let me be very clear what I mean by that. The average money market fund returns around 5% returns right now, even though benchmark rates are 525 to 550. That premium for liquidity is that differential of 25 plus basis points. On the other hand, when you think about a mint type of product, it's been averaging a yield to maturity north of 6% over the course of the past year. And that differential of returns not only shows up in the income, but the absolute returns that you will have along the way. So for those investors who have a good deal of cash, they may not necessarily need day-to-day -day liquidity, but have a liquidity horizon over the next few, uh, next few weeks or the next few months or even years, that's the way to sort of engage the market to earn those liquidity premiums, stay high in quality, average credit quality of AA minus, and, and at the same time, have the ability and expertise of PIMCO to go and find specific assets that are short dated, that have minimal amounts of interest rate exposure to earn these additional premiums along the way. And that's really where we found and garnered our interest against across a wide variety of investors, institutional, advisors, as well as individual investors because of the accessibility to go onto their platforms and buy and sell the uh, mint as they as they deem fit. So uh, that sounds like a really good alternative for a lot of investors for a lot of their cash holdings, and that's really what you've designed it to do. Compare it though to BILZ to the ultra short government active ETF. So BILZ was uh, was born out of the idea that over the past few years that government bond funds, government money market funds wanted to simply you know, be a safeguard for earning that high, high cost of uh, uh, short-term funds. BILZ was an actively managed approach to earn returns in that T-bill-like sector. So from that perspective, the quality on the BILZ ETF is 
you know, number one, to provide daily liquidity via ETF structure, but it also has money market like characteristics. It owns treasury bills, high quality treasuries, things like that, that really are insular to credit risk, doesn't have credit risk. What we want to think about in, in Mint is a longer term horizon. When I say longer term, we're not talking about years, we're talking about weeks and months. And that actually is pretty valuable to people. Some people, you know, want to know that they have day-to-day -day liquidity for functional things, you know, grocery bills, like margin calls if you're an institutional investor, things like this. But if your horizon is a bit longer, you want to earn additional premiums. And that doesn't mean that Mint is illiquid. In fact, it has trades hundreds of millions of dollars on any given day by our market makers with, generally speaking, a one-cent bid offer. That's very tight. And so from our perspective, we're just saying the holding period is longer, not that you can't obtain liquidity at those points in time. So we're willing to work with customers, educate them on those dynamics. But we find that there's a very distinct group, especially those that will begin to rationalize the bill and bills like holdings as yields come down. Mint has the ability to have higher total returns as they get the tailwind of those monetary policy uh, easings, those rate decreases over the medium term. Uh, and here's a, a question from one of the advisors uh, watching this today saying, after so many years of low interest rates, it's not been easy to talk clients into locking in for longer periods of time. It's hard to move them out of the money market funds that are paying 5%, as, as you, Jerome, had mentioned earlier. Uh, the idea of locking in for longer terms has been a difficult conversation. Some clients are expressing concern that interest rates even though they may come down shortly, they will go up again when inflation rises again. So what what talking points do you have? What tips do you offer for helping convince clients that they should get out of these money market funds and into other types of bond funds? So there's a few things to highlight here. And, and I'm very sympathetic to these discussions because we have them for all different types of clients, including the most sophisticated clients out there. Uh, and and I think that the consequence is, is that you know, a bird in hand may not necessarily be there in the future. It might fly away. And that's what we're dealing with at this point in time right now, is that we're on the precipice of these rate cuts. So as I mentioned before, bond investors, money market investors tend to linger a little too long in embracing this opportunity that they think is a bird in hand. The bird flies away and begins to, you know, begins to maneuver away as soon as the Fed begins to cut rates. So from a simple calculation, if you take where you are in terms of yields today at 5%, knowing that the Fed, according to market expectations, is gonna cut 250 basis points over the course of the next year plus, that means that you're earning potential decreases by that 200 plus basis points over that point in time. Put it in the construct of different strategies that have different interest rate exposures. More interest rate exposure means that the bond prices move higher or lower more since there's more sensitivity to it. What we're suggesting is not that you need to have a view of going and buying 30 year bonds. We're not suggesting that at all, but adding some interest rate exposure helps to create that price appreciation and moves you from the paradigm of simply earning yield and income to earning yield and income plus price appreciation. That's the consequence. And while it requires a little bit of bond math along the way to show your investors, the ultimate total return will be the differential between earning two plus percent of yields in, in a year in a money market fund and, you know, four to seven percent potential returns. And again, a low volatility diversified approach in, to in bond returns, which is, is a suggested outcome at this point in time, depending on strategy. If an advisor uh, wanted help from PIMCO in talking to clients or, or, or materials to assist them as they talk to them, does PIMCO offer that? Yeah, absolutely. They can go on our website at PIMCOETFs.com and look at specific strategies, things like that. There's also ways to assess different capabilities and help. Uh, many advisors have accessibility versus our field representat representatives. Uh, and, and, and we would encourage them to do that because there's a lot of great, quite frankly, there's a lot of great questions that come from the field. And it gives us great ideas about how the market is thinking and products and solutions that we can potentially provide to people. So Mint actually was born out of many of these discussions almost, 50, almost 18 years ago at this point in time. Bills was too. And so we find that these discussions are not just one-sided. We're not just simply you know, telling people what they should do and hope they do it. They're, it's really more of a collaborative event. And that's why the interaction on the, on the website, 
uh, it really is important and uh, and we welcome it at any point in time. The other thing is if they want more sensitivity to uh, exposure to different things that are topical, election outcomes, things like that, we have different resources along the way, along with our quarterly strategy sessions, which will ultimately be published in a newsletter. Those are all on the PIMCO website so they can access as well. And again, have some representation and, and interaction along the way. And, and they can feel free to reach out to me as well. I know that's a Pandora's box, but we welcome uh, it on the portfolio management side. So PIMCOETFs.com and uh, uh, your local uh, PIMCO rep will be able to get you in touch with Jerome as well. This question is about uh, mortgage-backed securities. Given what's going on in the real estate market, what's PIMCO's position on MBS? So when we think about this, there's two different levels. Of course, you want to think about the outlook of real estate market. And the real estate market is a nuanced market. Let me be clear. There's geographic diver there's geographic implications. There's different types of products, whether it's multifamily, commercial elements, office buildings, hospitality, and then obviously um, uh, when you think about single family homes. When people talk about mortgage-backed securities, the preponderance of mortgage-backed securities at this point in time comes in the form of owning a portfolio of mortgages of single family homes. And we typically have found that uh, over the history of PEMCO as being a very attractive asset class because they're high in quality. And at the same time, agency mortgages, which are guaranteed by the government, offer a premium over US treasuries. And what we found is there's opportunities given the structural changes in the marketplace. One of those evolved uh, you know, mid, uh, early last year in 2023 when the regional banks became under pressure. Uh, typically regional banks buy a lot of agency mortgages, but they quit buying those agency mortgages and that became an opportunity for our investors uh, in, in our bond funds. We're still finding that as an opportunity as a diversifier away from corporate credit and other avenues along the way. So while our outlook for housing might be a more muted outlook in terms of house home price appreciation than it was two or three years ago, the stability of the housing market, generally speaking, is very strong and owning agency mortgages and senior uh, and senior private label securities of mortgage product is still something that we like in general. On the commercial side, we admit it's a more nuanced approach and that you have to really look in the structure of some of those type of deals, but that's not generally where we're advocating more broadly for our investors to focus on right now, focusing on you know high quality agency mortgages. Meaning residential mortgages exactly. rather than commercial. Yeah. Which are uh, and, part of a portfolio, not necessarily the uh, a dominant theme in the portfolios. So in a given bond fund, what percentage of it may be in mortgage-backed securities? Yeah, so, so as an example in Mint, it might just be a handful of percentage points. Let's call it 5%, maybe 10%. And those are, again, our AAA rated securities, very qual very, uh, very focused on. But when you look on like more income-oriented strategies, like our P-yield ETF, you might find that that number is closer to 30 to 40%, and that will find different tactical approaches. It's a longer duration strategy, more interest rate exposure, but also the holding periods are expected to be longer because of its nature. And so we want to make sure that it has a balanced approach. So it's a great diversifier. So really depending on strategy, but that concentration shouldn't necessarily wor worry investors given the high quality and the credit rating, and most importantly, the liquidity of the asset class. And talk about muni bonds. So muni bonds are really interesting right now, as I said at the outset. We think about it in, in terms of not only the accessibility of our three municipal bond ETFs along the way, uh, at high, highlighted by SMMU on the short end uh, and our uh, MINO, M-I-N-O, uh, on the longer end. But what we think about is there's a lot of implications over the near term. Tax rates are probably going higher for some folks. They want to think about the after-tax benefits. At the same time, muni the, municipal in 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 the municipal universe, while inundated with interest from individual investors, is not necessarily a single bond approach. It can be, but we think about in the portfolio construction, the efficiencies of having institutional execution is really is really worth any fees you'll pay. And what we see is these diversified portfolios not only benefit from active credit management, active underwriting standards that allow you to earn better returns specifically on a risk adjusted basis compared to corporates. But as if you have concerns about where the economy is headed from a growth aspect, municipals might be a great diversifier, more resilient, historically speaking, than other more credit sensitive aspects of the broader marketplace. And so from that perspective, you know, focusing on longer duration instruments that on an after tax basis produce five and three quarters type of percent returns it is pretty attractive um, for, for most investors at this point in time, given the sensitivity. So we are very constructive on that, but we also are very focused and we suggest investors become very focused on how they enter and exit the market and recognize the fact that there are market inefficiencies that as PIMCO, we look to not only 
find opportunities for our clients, but mitigate those costs for our portfolios as well, which pass along to positive, more positive returns for our clients, we hope. This has been terrific information, Jerome. Uh, thank you very much. The the this, I don't think a topic that is more on it, people's minds in the world of investing uh, than the bond market. The Fed's getting a huge amount of attention uh, and deservedly so. And this has been a lot of really terrific information uh, that has been very, very valuable. So thank you for, for doing all that. Uh, I wanna let you know that we have three additional webinars coming up over the next couple of weeks all on crypto. Uh, Friday, September 20th, what you need to know uh, is going to occur in crypto in Q4, 20 amazing charts you really got to look at. On Wednesday, September 25th, unlocking alpha, going beyond uh, the crypto individual coins and tokens to the stock market and crypto equities. And on Wednesday, October 9th, Yielding, staking, lending, and custody going beyond the uh, new Bitcoin and Ethereum ETFs. Three terrific webinars coming up, all of them available for free. You get one CE credit for each one. You can register online at DACFP.com. Uh, I also want to encourage you uh, to download the new Spot Bitcoin ETF Toolkit and the Spot Ethereum ETF Toolkit, which gives you a really cool comparative chart. Uh, so that you can easily compare the new uh, ETFs that are available in the marketplace, lots of videos, audios, infographics, a lot of great information to help you understand these new ETF opportunities. And we encourage you to become certified in blockchain and digital assets. It's an online self-study course. You get up to 18 CE credits uh, that is offered by a world-class faculty, five different tracks. You can choose the one that is best for you uh, so that you can demonstrate to your clients that you know about this asset class uh, and there is a 25% savings if you use code ETH25 when you register. Uh, be sure to tune into my daily podcast, The Truth About Your Future, everywhere you get your podcasts and read my number one Amazon bestseller, The Truth About Crypto. Jerome Schneider, thanks so much for joining us on this podcast today. It was really terrific information. Look forward to doing with you again in the future. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. And good luck with, uh, with moving, thinking about fixed income as that balancing aspect of your portfolio. Thanks, everybody.